Hey everybody, happy Monday and welcome back to another fun edition of Book Club with Dark Jesse. So we are gonna continue our adventures into the Hunger Games. Um, if you guys remember from last post, we just finished up chapter nine. They were in the interview process and PETA just confessed that he uh, has a thing for Katniss. And so let's see what the reaction to that is. Oh, my camera tilted back. There we go. Okay, I think we're good now. All right, let's start. For a moment, the cameras held onto Peta's downcast eyes as what he says sinks in. Then I can see my face, mouth half open in a mix of surprise and protest, magnified on every screen as I realize, me, he means me. I press my lips together and stare at the floor, hoping this will conceal the emotions starting to boil up inside me. Oh, what a piece of bad luck, says Caesar, and there's a real edge of pain in his voice. The crowd is murmuring in agreement. A few have given agonizing cries. It's not good, agrees Peta. Well, I don't think any of us can blame you. It'll be hard not to fall for that young lady, says Caesar. She didn't know. Peta shakes his head. Not until now. I allow my eyes to flicker up to the screen long enough to see that the blush on my cheek is unmistakable. Wouldn't she just love to pull her back out here and get a response, Caesar asks the audience. The crowd screams, the, the crowd screams, sadly, rules are rules, and Katniss Everdeen's time has been spent. Well, best of luck to you, Peter Malark, and I think I speak for all of Pan Am when I say our hearts go with yours. The roar of the crowd is deafening. Peta has absolutely wiped the rest of us off the map with his declaration of love for me. When the audience finally settles down, he chokes out a quiet thank you and returns to his seat. We stand for the anthem. I have to raise my head out of the required respect and cannot avoid seeing that every screen is now dominated by a shot of Peta and me, separated by a few feet that in the viewer's heads can never be breached. Poor tragic us. But I knew better. After the anthem, the tributes file back into the training center lobby and onto the elevators. I make sure to veer into a car that does not contain Peta. The crowd shows our entourages of Stylists and mentors and chaperones, so we have only each other for company. No one speaks. My elevator stops to deposit four tributes before I am alone and then find the doors opening on the 12th floor. Peta has only just stepped from his car when I slam my palms into his chest. He loses his balance and crashes into an ugly urn filled with fake flowers. The urn tips and shatters into a thousand tiny pieces. Peta lands in the shards and blood immediate flows from his hands. What was that for, he says, aghast. You had no right, no right to go saying those things about me, I shout at him. Now the elevator's open and the whole crew is there, Effie, Heimich, Sina, and Port Portia. What's going on, says Effie, a note of hysteria in her voice. Did you fall? After she shoved me, says Peta, as Effie and Sina help him up. Heimich turns on me, shoved him. This was your idea, wasn't it? Turning me into some kind of fool in front of the entire country, I answer. It was my idea, says Peta, when seeing as he pulls spikes of pottery from his palms. Heimich just helped me with it. Yes, Heimich is very helpful to you, I say. You are a fool, Heimich says in disgust. Do you think he hurt you? That boy just gave you something you would never achieve on your own. He made me look weak, I say. He made you look desirable. And let's face it, you can sure use all the help you can get in that department. You were about as romantic as dirt until he wanted you. Now, they all do. You're all they're talking about, the star-crossed lovers from Dif District 12, says Hamage. But we're not star-crossed lovers, I say. Hamage grabs my shoulder and pins me against the wall. Who cares? It's all a big show. It's all about how you are perceived. The most I can say about you after your interview was that you're nice enough, although that in itself was a small miracle. Now I can say you're a heartbreaker. Oh, 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 how the boys back home fall love longingly at your feet which do you think will get you more sponsors the smell on his the smell of wine on his breath makes me sick I shove his hands off my shoulders and step away trying to clear my head Cinna comes over and puts his arm around me he's right Katniss I don't know what to think I should have been so told so I didn't look stupid no your reaction was perfect if you'd known it wouldn't have read as real says Portia She's just worried about her boyfriend, says Peta, gruffly, tossing away a bloody piece of an urn. 
My cheeks burn again at the thought of Gail. I don't have a boyfriend. Whatever, says Peta. But I bet he's smart enough to know a bluff when he sees it. Besides, didn't you say you loved me? So what does it matter? The words are sinking in, my anger fading. I'm torn now between thinking I'm used and thinking I've been given an edge. Heimage is right. I survived my interview, but what, what was I really? A silly girl spinning in a sparkly dress, giggling? The only moment of any ap substance I had was when I talked about Prim. Compare that to Thresh, who's his silent deadly power, and I'm unforgettable. Or I'm forgettable. Silly and sparkly and forgettable. N no, not entirely forgettable. Forgive, forgettable. I have my 11 in training. But now Peta has made an object of love, not just his. To hear him tell it, I have many admirers. But if the audience really thinks we're in love, I remember how strongly they responded to his confession. Star-crossed lovers. He mentions right. They can eat that stuff up in the capital. Suddenly, I'm worried that I didn't react properly. After he said he loved me, did you think I could be in love with him too, I asked. I did, said Portia. The way you avoided looking at the cameras, the blush. The others chimed in agreeing. You're golden, sweetheart. You're going to have sponsors lined up around the block, says Hamage. I'm embarrassed about my reaction. I forced myself to acknowledge Peta. I'm sorry I shoved you. Doesn't matter, he shrugs, although it's technically illegal. Are your hands okay, I ask? They'll be all right, he says. In the silence that follows, delicious smells of our dinner waft in from the dining room. Come on, let's eat, says Hamage. We all follow him to the table and take our places. But then Peta is bleeding too heavily and Portia leads him off for medical treatment. We start the cream and rose petal soup without them. By the time we're finished, they're back. Peta's hands are wrapped in bandages. I can't help feeling guilty. Tomorrow we will be in the arena. He has done me a favor and I have answered with an injury. Will I ever stop owing him? After dinner, we watch the replay in the sitting room. I seem frilly and shallow, twirling and giggling in my dress. Although the others assure me I am charming. Peta actually is charming and then utterly winning as the boy in love. And there I am, blushing and confused, made beautiful by Sinna's hands, de desirable by Peta's confession, and tra tragic by circumstances, and by all accounts, unforgettable. When the anthem finishes and the screen goes dark, a hush falls on the room. Tomorrow at dawn, we will be woken and prepared for the arena. The actual games don't start until 10, because so many of the district's residents rise late. But Peta and I must make an early start. There is no self telling how far we will travel to the arena that has been prepared for this year's games. I know Hamish and Effie will not be going with us. As soon as they leave here, they'll be at the games headquarters, hopefully madly signing up our sponsors, working out a strategy on how and when to deliver the gifts to us. Sinet and Portia will travel with us to the very spot from which we will be launched into the arena. Still, final goodbyes must be said here. Effie takes both of us by the hand and with actual tears in her eyes, wishes us well. Thanks us for being the best tributes it has been her privilege to sponsor. And then, because it's Effie and she's apparently required by law to say something awful, she adds, I wouldn't be surprised if I finally get promoted to a dis decent district next year. And then she kisses us on the cheek and hurries out, out overcome with either the emotional parting or the possible improvement of her fortunes. Hymich crosses his arms and looks at us both over. Any final words of advice, asks Peta. When the gong sounds, get, get out of there. You're neither of you, you are neither of you, I'm sorry, this line is confusing me. You're neither of you are up to the bloodbath of the cornucopia. Just clear out, put as much distance as you can between yourselves and the others and find a source of water, he says. Got it? And after that, I asked, stay alive, says Hamage. It's the same advice he gave us on the train. But he's not drinking and laughing this time. We only nod. What else is there to say? When I head to my room, Peta lingers to talk to Portia. I'm glad. Whatever strange words of parting we exchange can wait until tomorrow. My covers are drawn back, but there is no sign of a redhead Ovix girl. I wish I knew her name. I should have asked it. She could write it down, maybe, or act it out. 
but perhaps that could only result in punishment for her. I take a shower and scrub the gold paint, the makeup, the scent of beauty for my body. All that remains of the design team's efforts are the flames on my nails. I decide to keep those as a reminder of who I am to the audience. Katniss, the girl who was on fire. Perhaps it'll give me something to hold on to in the days to come. I pull on a thick fleecy nightgown and climb into bed. It takes me about five seconds to realize I'll never fall asleep. But I need sleep desperately because in the arena, every moment I give in to fatigue will be an invitation to death. It's no good. One hour, two, three pass and my eyelids refuse to get heavy. I can't stop trying to imagine exactly what terrain I'll be sh thrown into. Desert, swamp, a frigid wasteland. Above all, I'm hoping for trees, which may afford me some means of concealment, food, and shelter. Often there are trees because barren landscapes are dull and the games resolve too quickly without them. But what will the climate be like? What traps have the game makers hidden to line up the slower moments? And then what? Then there are my fellow tributes. The more anxious I am to find sleep, the more it eludes me. Finally, I'm too restless to even stay in bed. I pace the floor, heart beating too fast, breathing too short. My room feels like a prison cell. If I don't get air soon, I'm gonna start to throw things again. I run down the hall to the door to the roof. It's not only unlocked, but ajar. Perhaps somebody forgot to close it, but it doesn't matter. The energy field in closing the roof prevents any desperate form of escape. And I'm not looking to escape, only to fill my lungs with air. I want to see the sky and the moon on the last night that no one will be hunting me. The roof is not lit at night, but as, but as my bare feet reach its tiled surface, I see his silhouette, black against the lights that shine endlessly in the Capitol. There's quite a commotion going on down in the street, music and singing and car horns, none of which I could hear through the thick glass window panes of my room. I could slip away now without him noticing me. He wouldn't hear me over the over the din, but the night's air is so sweet. I can't hear I can't bear returning to the stuffy room cage of a room. But what difference does it make, whether we speak or not? My feet move soundlessly across the tiles. I'm only a yard behind him when I say, You should be getting some sleep. He starts but doesn't turn. I see him give his head a slight shake. I didn't want to miss the party. It's for us, after all. I came up beside him and leaned over the, over the edge of the rail. The wide streets are full of dancing people. I squint to make out their tiny figures in more detail. Are they in costume? Who could tell, Peta answers. With all the crazy clothes they wear, couldn't sleep either. Couldn't turn my mind off, I say. Thinking about your family, he asks. No, I admit bit, a bit guiltily. All I could do is wonder about tomorrow, which is pointless, of course. In the light from below, I can see his face now, the awkward way he holds his bandaged hands. I really am sorry about your hands. It doesn't matter, Katniss, he says. I've never been a contender in these games anyway. That's no way of thinking, I say. Why not? It's true. My best hope is not to disgrace myself and, he hesitates, and what, I say. I don't know how to say it exactly, only... I want to die as myself. Does that make sense? He asks. I shake my head. How could he die as anyone but himself? I don't want them to change me in there. Turn me in some sort of monster that I'm not. I bite my lip, feeling inferior. Well, I've been... While I've been contemplating on the availability of trees, Peta has been struggling with how to maintain his identity his purity of self. Do you mean you won't kill anyone, I ask? No, when the time comes, I'm sure I'll just kill just like everybody else. I can't go down without a fight. Only I keep wishing I could think of a way to, to show the capital they don't own me, that I'm more than just a piece in their games, says Peta. But you're not, I say, none of us are. That's how the games work. Okay, but within that framework, there's still you. There's still me, he insists. Don't you see? A little, only no offense. Who cares, Peta? I say, I do. I mean, what else am I allowed to care about at this point? He asks angrily. He locked his blue eyes on mine, demanding an answer. I take a step back. Care about what Hamage said and staying alive. Peta smiles at me, sad and mocking. Okay, 
Thanks for the tips, sweetheart. It's like a slap to the face. He uses his use of Hamish's patronizing endearment. Look, if you want to spend the last hours of your life planning some noble death in the arena, that's your choice. I want to spend mine in District 12. Wouldn't surprise me if you do, says Peta. Give my mother my best when you make it back, will you? Count on it, I say. Then I turn and leave the roof. I spend the rest of the night slipping in and out of doze, imagining the cutting remarks I will make to Peta Malark in the morning. Peta Malark. We will see how high and mighty he is when he's faced with life and death. He'll probably turn into one of those raging beast tributes, the kind who tries to eat someone's heart after they've killed them. There was a guy like that a few years ago from District 6 called Titrus. He went completely savage and the game makers had to have him stunned with electric guns to collect the bodies of the players he killed before he ate them. There are no rules in the arena, but cannibalism doesn't play well with the capital audience, so they tried to, head, they tried to, they tried to heat it off. There are some speculation that the avalanche that finally took Titus out was specifically engineered to ensure the victor was not a lunatic. I don't see Peta in the morning. Cinna comes to me before dawn, giving me a simple shift to wear and guides me to the roof. My final dressing and preparation will be done at the catacombs under the arena itself. A hovercraft appears out of thin air, just like the one who did that did in the woods that day. I saw the red-headed Ovix girl captured and a lad ladder drops down. I place my hands and feet on the lower rungs and instantly it is as if I am frozen. Some sort of current glues me to the ladder while I am lifted safely inside. I expect the ladder to release me then, but I'm still stuck when a woman in a white coat approaches me carrying a syringe. This is your tracker, Katniss. The stiller you are, the more effectively I can place it, she says. Still, I'm a statue, statue, but this doesn't prevent me from feeling the sharp stab of the pain as the needle inserts the metal tracker device deep into the skin of the inside of my forearm. Now the gamekeepers will always be able to trace my whereabouts in the arena, wouldn't want to lose a tribute. As soon as the tracker is in place, the ladder releases me. The woman disappears and Senna is retrieved from the roof. An Avix boy comes in and directs us to the room where breakfast has been laid out. Despite the tensions in my stomach, I eat as much as I can, although none of the delectable food makes any impression on me. I'm so nervous. I could be eating coal dust. The only thing that distracts me at all is the view from the windows as we sail over the city and then to the wilderness beyond. This is what a bird sees, only they're free and safe, the very opposite of me. All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, we will see you guys next week. All right, bye.